Hi, everybody. This is Pedro. Um, I finished watching Selena, the series part two last night, and I wanted to give you my quick take. Now, before we get started, make sure that you subscribe and that you do that bell thing that I, I don't really know what that bell thing does, but do that because other YouTubers ask you to do that. Um, also, forget about my um, eyes. Uh, <laughs> um, obviously, I stayed up very late to watch the entire series. Um, it wasn't just to be able to record this video. It, you know, I'm genuinely interested in watching the series and I don't want anything to color my experience with the series. I want to color my own experience with the series. So it was important for me to watch it right away uh, so that I would have a personal relationship with the series uh, in my own way versus reading other people's work or watching other people's videos. So I don't really have a real organized way of how I want to talk about this. I do have some notes that I wrote down, but they're more big picture notes rather than little nitpicky things. Uh, there are a couple of nitpicky things, I guess I should say. Um, but after seeing part one and part two, um, I definitely did get that tone shift between part one and part two that I thought that there would be. Um, my view was that when there were children, the series felt like a series, like a, like a children's series. And as they grew older, then you saw more adult themes. Um, I needed to see part two because to me, that's what I thought that I was seeing was that I was seeing the, the situations grow up in the filming and the story writing, like all evolving as the as the family members were evolving, um, which I think is a perfectly valid way to present a story. Uh, there's tons of books that are written in that format. There's a word for it, like where, you know, the, when somebody's a child, the words are very simple and the descriptions are very simple. And as they grow up, it gets a lot more complicated. We definitely see a lot more of Selena. We see a lot more of the performances that you're probably more familiar with that, or that a lot of people are more familiar with. Um, and they do a beautiful job in recreating a lot of those looks. Um, but here is, where my problem is with the series, and I don't think it has anything to do with some of the stuff that other people are going to mention. I feel that Selena has been underappreciated and underestimated as have her fans from before she passed away. Um, so I'm talking about SBK records. There's that whole scene of um, they want to change how she sounds because I guess what they're trying to say is that she sounds Mexican. I mean, that's what they're trying to say without saying it is in they're playing Captive Heart, which I'm not fond of that song, but I am 100 love Selena's performance on the song Captive Heart. If you haven't heard the entire song, don't even listen to the song. Listen to Selena singing that song. She chews the scenery or whatever the appropriate term is for, for music so well. Um, and the fact that SBK Records was like, oh, I don't know, we kind of want to water her down. is like, <laughs> that is the biggest complaint that I have about Dreaming of You and I Could Fall in Love is that she kind of doesn't sound like herself. Whereas in Captive Heart and I'm Getting Used to You, she gets to use more of her deeper qualities, her, her, her lower tone. But so there one people, the Grammys completely underestimated. Remember I have that whole other video where I talk about how, you know, she should have won a Grammy in 95. She should have won a Grammy in 96 for, Dream well, at least been nominated for a few songs in Dreaming of You. It's, I mean, they had to do so much overcorrection that the Grammy now gave Selena a Lifetime Achievement Award, a, life a Lifetime Grammy Achievement Award, which is like, that's great. But you should have given it to her when she was still alive. I know she won a Grammy. She should have won more. There's no other way to say it. Um, if her album is now in Rolling Stone's 500 top best albums of all time, you'd think she would have won for her category uh, in 1995 over Vicky Carr, uh, who was doing covers of old standards. Um, and, you know, Rolling Stone is a whole other thing. Um, tell me, Rolling Stone, did Selena's music get better through time? Or that music get worse that she can now be included? Because if I recall correctly, your review of Dreaming of You wasn't particularly kind uh, in 1995. And you seem to ignore her, never put her on the cover, never did a substantial article about her, except an article about her dad and money and all of that stuff. What about Selena's musical legacy? What about that, Rolling Stone? Anyway. Uh, her family underestimated her. You know, we see this throughout the series and... I think it happened in real life. And I think her family, including Chris, were completely overwhelmed by the fans' response to her murder. I don't think any of them were prepared for a 
for something like this to happen. Um, and that's fine, but it, to me, it really becomes evident that her family just really underestimated Selena. Um, I think Chris was obviously the one strong support system. I would have liked to have seen that more of that. I mean, I think you do get that Chris was the person who was there, but they did have their trouble in, in Chris talks about it in his book too. So I'm glad that that was portrayed as well, that it wasn't just sort of this happy go lucky marriage that it's like, we got married and now everything's fine, you know, like in the movie. And it's like, now we're going to have babies, you know, et, et cetera. Like they went through tough, rough patches, just like any other relationship does. Uh, which I think it was great for them to show that, you know, sort of drifting apart and coming back together. Because according to Chris's book and people who were there at the time um, in the book Como La Flor, that did interviews for the book Como La Flor, talk about Selena and Chris's rough patch that they people thought, oh, they're having trouble. Um, and Chris actually denied it for a while early on um, or just didn't want to talk about it in 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 his book. He really does come back and say, no, we, we really did have a lot of trouble actually and we almost thought about splitting up about you know perhaps divorce uh and then finally to me you know after her death we have a barrage of things that underestimate selena and her fans number one is the release of dreaming of you you know people were flabbergasted that this woman who they thought oh she's she she'll be popular amongst her people um who was cut from the soundtrack of Don Juan de Marco, where she did a duet. She recorded five songs for that album, uh, including uh, the very weird and very quirky duet with David Byrne, A God's Child. Uh, that was a song that I would often skip, but since then I have come to love it so much and you really get a sense of what Selena could do with her voice. Um, she apparently, according to David Byrne, she, um, uh, just added her own vocals that he gave very little direction that she chose to change the song into English I mean into Spanish from English and that when the record executives who were doing um, the Don Juan de Marco soundtrack heard that Selena was singing in Spanish they kind of said like oh well we were going to make this into a single but now it's part in Spanish and so we don't think we'll release it uh, and we're not even going to use it for the movie and that David Byrne was like well she's kind of known for singing in Spanish you know and so again, and, and they took it out of the Don Juan de Marco soundtrack. And guess what num was number one in, you know, right around that time, Selena's Dreaming of You album that ended up selling more, becoming the fastest selling debut uh, for a female of that time. Only Michael Jackson at that point had sold um, as many albums as quickly as she did. So complete underestimation. I re distinctly recall reading an Entertainment Weekly article the week that Selena's Dreaming of You came out, they had like this, um, they have this section where they talk about, you know, sort of the charts and moves in the album. And I remember they were talking about Alanis Morissette um, because her album, Jagged Little Pill, which became the, you know, huge album in the 90s, had just gone into the top 10. But Selena had debuted at number one. And what the article talked about was, he said, this was completely unexpected. You know, Selena's album was was expected to do well, but nobody was expecting it to debut at number one at this level. Um, very quickly thereafter, Entertainment Weekly put Selena on the cover. Um, you know, People Magazine had that terrible misguided, you know, they, they pat themselves on the back over this and it's more like, come on. Um, they put Selena in, you know, a few of the, of, of, of the People Magazine covers. Um, at the same time as the rest of the country got the cast from Friends uh, on the cover with Selena, Tiny Little Picture. So they said, well, we'll put her in the cover just in Texas and in, in California, I believe. And then the rest of the country is probably going to be interested more on the cast of Friends. It sold out so many copies of the, of the version with Selena on the cover that they ended up having to create a special commemorative issue just for Selena. At the time, there were only two other commemorative issues that had been done. One was for Jacqueline Kennedy on Assis, and the other one was for Audrey Hepburn. And so what I'm getting to is I believe Netflix cheated us uh, with budget on this. So there's a couple of things that are happening. There's some odd storytelling stuff, but I'm not a big fan of like, this is us. I'm not a big fan of Glee. I'm not a big fan of any... All those kind of like schmaltzy, 
lovey family kind of stuff. Um, I don't see this being that much different than that. So it could have been a glee, you know, I, it could have been a whatever. But it can't be that because of the darn green screens, for example, that are so terrible. Um, and I don't, I don't see this as a production issue. I, I'm, I 100% believe that if they had been given a bigger budget, that they would have been able to create much more believable scenery. And, and hear me out, because I was very happy that Netflix was doing this, and I defended the series so much to people who are criticizing it online, because we need to give the opportunity for the people who worked on the crew and the cast to shine. If you look at the IMDb pages for the series, these are a lot of people. This, this is the first time being given a really huge um, project to work on. And I think that the people showed that they could do well. But I don't think that a green screen um, is a director's choice, that the director was like, eh, you know, just get the cheap $3.99 green screen. Nobody's going to notice the difference. I mean, I don't know who did special effects. I don't know if that's considered a special effect or how, how, what that is. But I have a feeling that for whatever reason, uh, the budget just wasn't there. And so to me, that's Netflix underestimating Selena's potential. They did a great marketing campaign. You know, they put billboards all over and all of that stuff. Uh, but I think that's after they realized what a huge response it got. Um, and so they kind of thought, oh, maybe we have a hit on our hands. Similar to the way that SBK Records promoted the hell out of Dreaming of You after they realized, oh, maybe Selena is a really important, well-respected artist that is loved by people. Maybe, maybe we should do like a really good job on this. Um, whereas before they were telling her like, oh, you need a vocal coach, you know, because we don't like the way you sing. And what I see is a cast and crew that's trying really, really, really hard to be loving and to be per portray Selena in the way that they believe she deserves to be portrayed. That's what I see. What I see is Netflix not giving them the tools to be able to do something incredibly epic. Let's put it down this way why I'm saying that this is a Netflix fault. So season four of The Crown, which came out before, after the Selena movie, I can't, I, series, I can't remember, but it came out, you know, around, you know, similar time frames, had 29 million viewers, and they were talking about how they had increased it from 20, I don't know, the, the, by like 20, you know, I think season three was like 21 million viewers or, or 20, I don't know, something. Selena the series had 25 million viewers, only a few less viewers than season four of The Crown. Season four that have been nominated for a ton of awards and all this stuff. You go back to season one of The Crown and you see the type of production that they were able to give. And you can tell what kind of production, it, what kind of budget something has by the type of sets, by the type of costumes, by the type of care, by the length, you know, all of these, all of these kind of things that are clues as to, as to a budget. Um, and you mean to tell me that Selena the series had 25 million viewers, you know, off the get-go, and the dis and, and the crown had less viewers in season one. Why wasn't the Selena series given the same amount of budget? I don't think the cast and crew were given the full resource of, Net of Netflix. I think that they gave it similar treatment, a similar treatment to other shows that they produce for Latin American audiences, which are not as well funded as those that are made for Anglo audiences, even though those shows are pulling in about the same amount of viewers. What the heck is up with that? Well, I sounded like Larry David. Anyway, so that, that I mean, that really upsets me to think about it in that way, that I think they did a really good job. I think that, that the writers and Christian and uh, supporting characters tried so hard to be so loving um, and really provide a hug to Selena fans to say, we, we know, we know what you like. We know what you want to see. We know how you want to see it. And we're doing our very, very best to bring it to you. But I do not believe that they had the full support. And you know who else didn't have the full support? Selena. 
in real life. And so that's one thing that I got from the series. Uh, the hardcore fans kind of know that Selena's family wasn't uh, the most supportive about her boutiques. Um, and so I'm glad that they did show this. Um, I don't th think that they showed the full extent of how um, cooperative they were. Um, I don't believe they were there for the opening of the boutiques. Um, and I believe that I read in an article that, you know, her fashion show wasn't attended by her family. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember. But they, they weren't quite that supportive, even less so than what's shown on the, on the series. Um, Chris apparently was very supportive um, in... But at the same time, um, Chris will talk about talks about it in his book that he didn't know how to like support like he didn't he wasn't necessarily helping her. Um, and we see in behind the scenes and all of this other stuff. Chris wasn't in the picture. He wasn't there like you know flying with her to Monterrey to like pick out um, clothing samples or things like that. Um, a lot of that Selena did on her own. Now whether she chose to do it on her own because she wanted to do it on her own, or if it was because you know the family wasn't supportive, or Chris just you know couldn't be supportive because this this I mean it's fashion. He wasn't going to be he wasn't going to be um, you know what telling her what to do or say for fashion. So uh, you know she really depended on Martin Gomez. She really depended on Yolanda. Uh, these people that she had created around the cocoon around the boutiques. But one of the things that, that, that the series tried to do, but I don't know if uh, this came through. I, I understand this because I understand the story of what happened. But so Selena had been, you know, performing for, you know, like what, 15 years or something like that, 20, um, like 15 years or something like that. And she was chugging along, doing better, singing Los Dinos. Now she's solo. She's doing great. She has, you know, Como La Flor, which is like a staple song. And then 1994 came and it was like, just shot up through the roof. So think about this. In 1994 is when she wins her Grammy and is nominated for a second one. Uh, in 1994 is when her boutiques open up. In 1994 is when she gets her first number one top of the Latin charts album. So she had had other chart topping albums, uh, but they were in the regional charts or... Um, or other charts, not the tippy top of the Latin album chart. So to put it into context, um, Gloria Stefan had created a um, Spanish language album after having all of the success in the English uh, in the English market, recorded a Spanish language album, which was really, really anticipated, spent, you know, dozens of weeks as number one until Selena's Amor Prohibido was released and took over the number one spot over Gloria. Gloria Stefan. So it was huge fodder. It was like, who is this girl like who just came out of nowhere? Like, yeah, we've heard Como La Flor and all these things, but but Amor Prohibido was just astronomical as to how well it did. It also gave her her first solo number one um, hits. So she had, I believe, four hits. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I believe number ones were Amor Prohibido, Biri Biri Bam Bam, um, No Me Queda Más, uh, and Si Una Vez, I mean, I'm sorry, not Si Una Vez, uh, Fotos y Recuerdos, Si Una Vez was also high up. But so she had not had a number one song, a Latin all charts number one song until Amor Prohibido was released. She had had two other number one hits, but they were both with duets. The uh, duet with Alvaro Torres, Buenos Amigos, which we saw in the series. Um, and then the other one was Donde Quiera Que Estés, which was with the... Uh, um, the Barrio Boys, um, which they don't show in the series. Those were her two number one hits, uh, top of the charts. Como La Flor had gone to the top of the regional charts, um, the Mexican-American charts, the, 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 you know, that, that type of music. They, have trop they, had, they had three basic charts, pop, uh, tropical, which is like salsa and all of those things, and then essentially like other, like they call it regional Mexican-American. Um, and so that includes a whole bunch of variety of music that is just sort of like a hodgepodge of everything else that doesn't fit into these two, so it just sort of goes there. Um, so she had reached the top of those charts, but all of those songs are then ranked to be the, the tippy, tippy top of the charts. So that's where you saw, you know, artists like Luis Miguel. That's where you saw artists like Gloria Stefan, and she had reached that level now. She was at the tippy, tippy top, had four number one hits from that one album, uh, 
was astronomical, had a Grammy under her belt, had another Grammy nomination. Um, what are the things? Um, SBK Records signed her in 1994. And here is how I feel about um, that, all of that happening. And they kind of show a little, I mean, they, they show it happening, but I don't think they put the importance that this meant in, in, in maybe it did, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe for other people it did. I, I, I thought, like, are people gonna understand that this is all happening like within a span of a few months? Her boutiques opening, SBK signing, her number one album, winning the Grammy, like all of this like was just like packed into, you know, even part of a year. Uh, and so the stress level was real. And then you have Suzette, like, making her feel guilty about missing lunch with her and her mom? Are you kidding me? This, I, I understand Suzette was involved with the production of this and was an executive producer and AB was also consulted. And I am can only imagine how much more of jerks they were in real life. Excuse me, I'm sorry. If this is what they showed in the series. Um, there is another line that is like uh, Suzette telling her like, you know, Selena is is got married and Suzette is kind of angry at her and Selena is like, did, did I do something wrong? And and Selena is trying to tell her, it's like, I had to like hide my love for this man. Like, can you put yourself in my shoes and, you know what I had to go through? And Suzette responds back with like, try not knowing where your sister is for a day. It's like, you honestly think that those things are the same? AB, you, you're honestly upset about helping Selena pick songs for her multi-platinum album? Because here's the other part that, that we need to understand. So the family had made an agreement that the music business was a shared thing. They made this a while ago, I believe before Selena shut up, that they were going to split the proceeds four ways from the music. The boutiques were all Selena's own. <clears throat> that was all her own thing. And but all of the stuff that came from the music, including the promotional stuff like um, uh, Coca Cola, uh, which they also didn't show, they didn't show any of the her becoming spokesperson for all these things. But like the Coca Cola, the Agri Shampoo, all of that stuff, they decided that all of that would be split four ways. So Selena agreed to this, and I believe Selena agreed to it willingly. Um, but that one part would go to her father, one part would go to AB. One part would go to Suzette, and one part would go to Selena, and they would split it four ways. That is why today Chris still gets a quarter of the Selena empire. He's getting the part that Selena would have received. He he's getting that. Um, there's some, you know, arguments as to whether they are giving him the full amount of money, but you know, we'll let the courts decide that. Um, but so. AB, like with his, all the stress about the album and Suzette with all the stress about like taking on responsibilities other than being a drummer. Um, like, it's like, listen, Selena was the one paying the bills for all of y'all. And you mean to tell me that you couldn't like just be like, hey, Sal, maybe I'll, I'll bring you lunch. Where are you going to be? I'll, I'll bring you some lunch. Why did Chris have to be the only one that seemed to be looking out for her? Um I, the fans have known about this for a while, the hardcore fans, you know, this isn't a new thing, but this series sort of puts it a lot more in perspective and being like, Jesus, like, how could they not have, why didn't Suzette become her assistant, you know, through all of this? Why wasn't Suzette the one instead of Yolanda and instead of all of these other people being like, why do you need sell? You want me to go and like meet up with the contractor? Here, I'll take this call. Don't worry about it. Like you you know, you're doing a lot right now and we want to help you out with your business. So to me, it creates a much clearer picture. So and that's my next point um, as to why Selena is not alive today is that because of that 1994 with all of these things happening and things falling through the cracks, Yolanda sees an opening, you know, just wide enough for her to fit in. Um, and she goes through it and she earns Selena's confidence and puts herself into a role that she shouldn't have been in. Uh, that all these people who had been all about family and all about protecting Selena left this huge gaping door open for Yolanda to just walk in 
why she was going through all of these record deals and lunches and stuff by herself when she was so protected, um, I don't understand. Why, why weren't they there to help her? Um, and I mean help her, but not tell her what to do. Because that would the other part that I also got. It's like, for goodness sake, like, give the woman some breathing room. Um, rather than constantly trying to stand in her way of what she wants to do, why not say, listen, if this is what you want to do, what can we do to help? Now, I understand that's not how family dynamics always work. She was the baby of the family. She was much younger than the other. You know, they probably said, like, well, Selena is always kind of flighty and, and stuff. I'm sure that they didn't see what we see now in retrospect, which was a driven woman who was ambitious, who was hardworking, who was at the brink of collapse. Um, you know, they saw Selena, the, the, the little kid that was always leading their band. And so they treated her as such. Um, but man, like it, it doesn't make it any easier to stomach. And so I think that because the family are, produ are the producers for the series, uh, that the writers and directors and all that are trying to let you in through a little peek, like a little peephole to see the difficulties, but they're not right there in the room. So they're trying to, you know, to say, I think, like kind of read between the lines. You know, the family wasn't particularly supportive. We can't say that because the family is our executive producers. They're allowing us to give you a flavor, but you need to read a little bit further than that, that like Selena was really stressed. That's the other thing that hardcore fans really know is that Selena was really, really stressed out for that year. So one of the things, she, she had some health problems with her hair, um, it, 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 what is shown now is that um, she might have been losing her hair due to stress. So I saw another YouTuber who was incredulous over the fact that Selena would be distressed because she always seemed so in control. And I was like, no. And if you see the old VH1 behind the music, you'll see sort of the level of stress that she was under. Um, it was a lot. There was a lot happening. I tried to, you know, walk you through all these things that happened in one year. So you can only imagine how stressful that was for Selena. And on top of that was the fact that she was going to be alone. Her, her comfort bubble, her family that had shielded her was being pried away from her. Um, and she was having, you know, that, those troubles with Chris. And so it was incredibly stressful for her. I don't think that the series raised the stakes high enough to what she must have been feeling. You know, they definitely show, you know, her sort of feeling like she's having a panic attack, um, looking a little bit more tired, a little bit more stressed. But, um, you know, according to Chris's book, which would have been great collaborated, is sort of when the doors were shut, she would just collapse and cry about the pressure that she was under. Um, that maybe her family, the fans, the cameras never saw, but Chris got to see. And it sorely needed that point of view um, to just see that Selena you know, as he describes, Chris describes in his book, you know, being on the floor crying out of, you know, really no specific reason, uh, but just out of the pressure that she was under. And he often talks about us to saying, you know, most people saw that she was smiley and bubbly, but as hard as she laughed is as hard as she cried um, because there was just so much that was riding on her. And we do see Selena, the, you know, which I, I, I commend Christian, that, you know, you see this sort of like, she's trying to take a deep breath and trying to enjoy it all and, and being firm about moving forward, even while she's trying to make her family happy, her husband happy. Um, and I think that is an unfortunate truth, is that Selena, at the end of the day, had very little time to decide what she wanted to do because she was often getting stuck in the middle of other people's, you know, stuff. She was stuck in the middle between her father and Chris. She was stuck in the middle of, you know, Yolanda and her father. She was stuck in the middle of her music career and in and, and her fashion career. And she kind of just had to make it all work. So I'm a kudos to the series for at the very least allowing us a little glimpse into that. Uh, because I think that that was really important to be able to cover. And then Finally, the last thing that I wanted to point out was I needed more Selena. <laughs> um, there is, to me, the chef's kiss is Christian Serratos on, at the Astrodome, waving at the fans, getting on stage, doing Amor Provido and doing Como La Flor 
I 100% will challenge you to show me a more accurate portrayal of Como La Flor than what Christian Serratos did. Uh, it was phenomenal, the way she recreated, the most she looked like such a natural. She didn't look rehearsed. She looked, it was like she was just acting out of, you know, things that came naturally to her. The dancing was great. I thought the lip syncing was great. The emotion was right. Um, to me, that's what the entire series could have been. I'm really not a big fan of the concert scenes for this. Not because I think they're bad, but because I don't necessarily need to see them. I, I, I want more time, you know, knowing about Selena's life than, than recreating a performance that I can see a million times on YouTube. Um, I want to know what happened before and after that performance. So, but they did a really good job on that Astrodome scene. It was late and I was a little teary-eyed, but there were some angles that Christian just looked so much like Selena and just, you know, and I don't really care about the look alike. It was just the essence of her that you sort of get to see Selena, this driven person, which I love to be able to see this driven person on stage versus a much more shy and reserved person off stage. Um, and then she would go into the interviews and there she was again, you know, perky and nice and, and, and confident. And that's what she portrayed. And then when she got into her real life, she was not as confident. She was very scared. She was nervous. And from what we read, that's true. That's Selena was going through a lot of those things. And so I think that the Astrodome scene was perfection. It's what exactly the entire series should have been. It's to me reminds me of a, the crown recreation versus the cast and crew trying to figure out how are we going to make this work uh, and make it as, as great as possible. I think they used all of their budget and everything like to because they knew that the fans would be judging the entire series based on that Astrodome scene. Um, at the same time, um, I had wished, for example, in the Nomike, I was really looking forward to the Nomike Damas scene uh, because I was hoping that they would show the meaning. I wish they leaned in more. I wish we had to see more of Hunter Reese, who plays Ricky, and Carlos, who plays Joe. Um, I wish we had seen a little bit more of their interactions. We barely, you know, heard anything from Freddie and Don, you know, they're just sort of like there, they just appear, uh, which was also the mistake of the movie. They just kind of appear. I, I'm pretty sure that must've been a pretty big deal for, for Selena to have backup dancers and singers. Like that, that must've been like a, something that she had always wanted, but I don't know. So I kind of wish that they had leaned into the No Me Queda Mas more and really, you know, dug in the knife into our hearts. But even then I do think that, um, it was touching. Uh, they didn't have to say very much, uh, but I thought that 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 then I'm glad that they showed the Nomiquera Mas scene. And on the flip side, I am so angry at the ending that that last song, the Bidi Bidi Bomb Bomb that song that they used was not released until after her death. That's not the sound that she heard. That's not the sound that she was familiar with. You know, this is the A-B version after Selena passed away of redoing Bidi Bidi Bam Bam, re-engineering re it, which replaces all the original instruments and the in instrumentation, which I don't like. I not only do not like that instrumentation, but I don't like that Selena never actually heard that. So that's it. That is my quick take. I put quick in quotes because obviously this video is going to be very long. Uh, but I'm talking about Selena and I can, you know, you're lucky that I didn't make this three hours long. Um, but I did enjoy the series. I just wish for more. Um, I particularly enjoyed how much tender, loving care Christian put into this role. I think that nobody worked as hard as she did. Similarly to the way that nobody worked as hard as Selena and the people around her. Um, that's fantastic. That's great. That's a wonderful legacy to leave behind for both Selena and for Christian to be seen as the hardest working person in your in your group and to feel like you've earned that respect and that admiration. Um, so let's continue to keep it classy, folks. Let's continue to be supportive and critical to improve the storyline and the storytelling and the productions and the availability of projects that celebrate Selena or celebrate the people or the issues or the things that, that Selena cared about. 
Um, so that's my only recommendation out there is be respectful. There's always a way to be respectful without being mean, uh, particularly trashing people's work that are obviously Selena fans. Take care.